Hello everybody, Simon Dixon here, just pulling out the archives. And here is a video from 2018, where I was in Tokyo, Japan, and we were running an event for um, investors in Japan. And towards the end of my presentation, we had a quick debate with uh, Roger Ver. Um, now, if you don't know, Roger Ver was one of the early advocates for Bitcoin, and he was there from the very beginning. Um, and uh, we owe a lot to Roger Ver for our industry. But in around about, uh, there was a, a long scaling debate that happened, um, which was a very dark time in, uh, in Bitcoin's history. Um, but we were constantly debating in the, in the Bitcoin industry about how to scale Bitcoin for the masses. Um, and really, it came down to two arguments in the end. Some people believe that um, you need to keep every, basically the way Bitcoin works is all transactions are packaged together into a block. Um, and uh, every 10 minutes, miners go out and verify all those. That's what prevents the need for having a central bank uh, or a government or a bank in the middle because uh, people running these computers get to verify all the transactions. Um, but the way it's achieved, the way the, the word blockchain comes from is it's a chain of blocks. Uh, it's, a, it's a bunch of uh, transactions that are put together into a block and then they, the miners go out and verify them. And that's what actually allows your transaction to be sent globally. Uh, some people believe that uh, we should increase the size of the blocks, but there's a side effect. And that side effect is that um, that can lead to uh, it becoming very expensive for these, these uh, computers called nodes, which is a part of the, the mining operation. Um, and therefore, it can lead to um, more centralization and it being very expensive to perform those verification tasks um, in a simple form. Uh, but the benefit is that transaction fees get cheaper and cheaper. Uh, the other side of the argument is that, the, that because the, the blocks get full, uh, the more people try to transact on Bitcoin. Uh, when the blocks get full, then people have to pay a higher fee to try and beat the other people in a queue. Um, and therefore, the fees get higher and higher. And as the fees get higher, it becomes more expensive to use Bitcoin. Um, but you can optimize for decentralization because the task of verifying all those transactions is not as expensive. Um, and really, uh, this, this came down to the debate. It was, do we want to compromise decentralization in order to make the, the fees cheaper? Or do we want to keep things as they are um, and uh, not compromise, you know, make decentralization and censorship resistance the most important thing, uh, but have more expensive fees as more people are using Bitcoin? Um, and this came a very, very contentious debate. Couple that with the fact that actually nobody controls Bitcoin. So because it's a decentralized network, you have developers competing with miners, competing with businesses, influential businesses like exchanges and wallets, and then you have users. Overall, um, I, you know, I think I could have done a lot better debating this. Um, you know, the, the conversation, I think it was, uh, my British side coming out where I was politely uh, standing by, I think, lesson learned. Uh, sometimes you've got to be a bit more aggressive with these debates. Um, but if I was a little less polite, I think I could have got a lot more points in. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what I would have done differently if we get to do that over again. So the resolution in the end was that uh, Bitcoin remained unchanged, implemented a few changes to allow for um, scaling off the outside of the blocks and a new coin was created called Bitcoin Cash and there was a big debate around um, people who consider Bitcoin Cash the real Bitcoin and Bitcoin being Bitcoin um, and uh, eventually the two different communities went off on their way and so that brings us to this stage when we were debating Bitcoin Cash versus Bitcoin um, during the, the heat of the the heated moment and i'll move over to the debate roger up to the stage um, and as i said roger has been involved in this industry since before me um, one of the advocates for the industry and we've reached a completely changing time 
uh, in financial history um, in terms of the Bitcoin economy and the crypto economy. And uh, I think we're going to have a, a discussion about where we go next. Thank you, Simon. Okay. Uh, so is, is someone actually moderating this, or are we doing this on our own? Yeah. So Simon and I have been friends yeah. for a long time, and I, I think we can handle it with the two of us. Okay, Just fine. Do Does that work for you? All right. You want to state your position, and then take okay. as much time as you need, and we'll go from there if that works. Yeah. Um, well, maybe you start with, um, you know, what, what happened to Bitcoin, where you think, uh, where you think we're going next. Sure, I'll, I'll gladly start. So. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, my name is Roger Veer. I'm the CEO of Bitcoin.com. And as Simon mentioned, I was the first person in the entire world to start investing in uh, Bitcoin-related startups. And at that time, there wasn't really a word cryptocurrency. It was only Bitcoin. Uh, and I've been giving a little speech about Bitcoin that I started giving seven and a half years ago. And that's that thanks to the invention of Bitcoin, you can now send and receive any amount of money with anyone anywhere in the world instantly basically for free, and there's nothing that anybody can do to stop it. And that speech was very true about Bitcoin in 2011, 2012, 2013, 14, 15, and then somewhere in between 2016 or 17, it stopped being true about Bitcoin. But today, that same speech I've been giving for seven and a half years is still true about Bitcoin Cash it's no longer true about Bitcoin Core. So last year in August, for those that aren't aware, bit, there was one single Bitcoin, but it then split into two versions of Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Core. And the developers behind the Bitcoin Core project today openly say that they want Bitcoin Core transactions to be slow, expensive, and unreliable, while the Bitcoin Cash developers want it to be fast, cheap, and reliable. The Bitcoin Core developers openly mock people who want to use Bitcoin Core as money. They don't think it should be used as a currency, whereas the Bitcoin Cash developers and the Bitcoin Cash community want Bitcoin to be usable as cash. And I actually have a really good demonstration, I think, here. Can I see, is there, are there three people in the audience that don't have some Bitcoin Cash yet and would be interested in having some? And I see one, two, three. So if you don't mind, maybe we'll, if I can invite you down to the stage here. And I brought in my pocket here what's called a paper wallet. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm hiding the secret key here. This is the public key. On this wallet, don't, don't be shy, one, one, two, three. And if I can ask you, uh, if you don't... Bitcoin Cash, I don't have any other Bitcoin Cash, paper wallet, and it's going to be printed. So, so あの Bitcoin Cash of the people who are in the world are in the world. Okay. Jimmy, do you have Bitcoin Cash or not yet? Jimmy, Jimmy, welcome. Yeah, Jimmy. I've known Jimmy for a long time as well. So um, I need you all to have, uh, I think Bread Wallet will probably work, the Bitcoin.com wallet will work for sure. So if you don't have the Bitcoin.com wallet, Maybe you can install it real quick from the App Store. And so while there, everyone's installing the Bitcoin.com wallet here, um, I'll explain what's on this piece of paper here. So on this piece of paper, this is the public key. Hidden behind the fold here is the private key. That's all that's required in order to claim the money. On this wallet, there is exactly, as of an hour ago, $10 worth of Bitcoin cash and $10 worth of Bitcoin core. And what we're going to do is we're going to bounce it down the line here. We'll have the first person here scan it once he has the app installed. And we're looking for the Bitcoin.com wallet. That's the one. So this, this one right here. The first one is an advertisement. The second one is the Bitcoin.com wallet. And so what we'll do is we'll take the $10. They'll scan it from my paper. It'll go onto the first phone. He'll send it to the next person. And then finally, he'll send it to Jim or maybe this young lady here as well. And what you're about to see is that we're starting off with $10 of both Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Core. By the time we get to the end of the line here, this young lady will wind up with $10 of Bitcoin Cash. And she'll wind up with six, seven, eight, if she's really lucky, maybe $9 of Bitcoin Core, but I would guess it's gonna be somewhere in the $7 range, I would guess. 
So just from moving it down the line here, we're going to lose 30% of the value. That's not a currency. That's not money. That's some sort of science project at this point. Whereas Bitcoin Cash still has all the characteristics that made it the worldwide phenomenon that it is today. It still has all the characteristics that made me fall in love with it back in 2011. It still has all the characteristics that made Simon get excited about it back in 2011. So Bitcoin Cash today is Bitcoin. Bitcoin Core is something else. And so here he is, he's ready. Here's the private key, so go ahead and scan that. And I'll be the narrator here as we go. There we go. So you're going to hit sweep paper wallet. And it's going to scan, and you can tell us how much money you see on both the Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Core address here. Uh, so we're starting with how much Bitcoin Cash? Uh, 0 0.10997. There's, there's US dollar value. Uh, $9.91. So where's, and then how much Bitcoin Core? Uh, no point. Uh, oh, 10 point. Yep. Okay. So we're actually starting out with less Bitcoin Cash because things are fluctuating a little bit. So we have $9.91 of Bitcoin cash and ten dollars and two cents of bitcoin core so go ahead and hit sweep and so it's sweeping the wallet let's try that one more time let's try the other button there so yeah we said, we said air querying the blockchain, so that's not the best demo, but here we go. There we go, so funds transferred of Bitcoin Core, and then hit the, uh, OK here. And then you're gonna actually have to scan it one more time, I think. There we go, so hit sweep paper wallet. And so get, <coughs> So go ahead and hit sweep. So we're just going to do the Bitcoin version here. And someone text Emil about the back end server there, too. So oh, there we go. Third time's the charm. So go ahead and hit OK. And now, do you have your wallet ready? So you're going to hit skip. You almost have it set up. You don't, the email is optional, so hit skip right here. Skip the touch and then that one's okay. Hit the receive button. And so now you're gonna go here and hit send. And then who, can, while we continue our discussion, hey Jake, yep. can I have you come down here and help them guide sending the money on down the line? And when everyone's done sending the money, we'll make sure each of you get $10 at the, at the end of this, so. And so uh, anyhow, we'll wait a moment or two as they bounce it on down the line. Some of them are installing the wallet for the first time. And Simon and I can talk about this a little bit more, but you're going to see we started out with less Bitcoin Cash at the beginning. I guarantee you by the time it gets to the end, there's going to be more Bitcoin Cash left by a significant amount, and there'll be much less Bitcoin Core. And so ask yourself, if you send money from just three or four people here in line, and suddenly by the time the end of the people get in line, yeah, you, you want to join us too? Don't be shy. If you wind up with about half of the money left, that's not a currency, and that's not what Bitcoin's all about. It's right there in the original white paper for Bitcoin, is that it's a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. If I take out uh, a traditional dollar bill, <laughs> hand this down the line. <laughs> hand that down the line if you don't mind. Pa take it and pass it down to the end, and let me know when it gets to the end. Keep passing. <laughs> Okay, all of it still made it to the end. That's how Bitcoin Cash works today. Bitcoin Core no longer does. And I'm, I see you're sweating a little bit there, Simon, but uh, I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, uh, so for those, I, I don't know the level of sophistication of everyone in the audience. I, I'm assuming it's a pretty sophisticated audience, but maybe some of you are new um, to this industry. Um, essentially, over, over the years, um, Roger was talking about um, the, you know, the, the blocks were, Essentially, you batch every transaction. I don't want to go into the geeky stuff, but you batch every all the transactions that happen every 10 minutes. 
you put them into a block, and then if those blocks are full, um, it gets delayed for the next block, or um, there's this thing called a fee market, and you have to try and pay more in order to get it included in this block so that you can get a faster transaction. Do you think that that's a good thing? Um, well, it's, uh, it, it comes down to this three-year debate that has been happening about how to actually scale Bitcoin. So, if we could, it's, it's, sometimes it's quite hard to actually remember the history because so much happens. Um, but the original um, thing was that I believe that these, this fee market was introduced as a way of trying to reduce spam transactions because there was unlimited demand for people trying to put more and more data and more and more things in these blocks. And then originally that was the purpose. Would you agree that was the purpose of the fee market? Sure. So for the first eight years of Bitcoin's history, transactions were basically free. They were either completely free or less than a penny. And then in the, the, maybe the last two years or so, a small group of people using censorship and propaganda and literally deleting anybody's post from these discussion forums online that didn't agree with them. They would literally delete the post. Uh, they changed the entire way Bitcoin worked. So the transactions, instead of being free or basically free, in December of last year, the average fee for a single Bitcoin transaction was $50, about 5,000 yen for one single Bitcoin transaction. So while Bitcoin transactions previously had been basically free, and Bitcoin grew into a worldwide phenomenon used by millions of people around the world, and with people excited about it all over the world, they veered away from that roadmap that had been incredibly successful, and intentionally changed the Bitcoin network into something that was slow, expensive, and unreliable in an attempt to stop spam. But what we saw happen is it didn't just stop people from spamming the Bitcoin network, it stopped people from using it at all. And people who previously were using Bitcoin started using things like Ethereum, and Dash, and Zcash, and Ripple, and all sorts of competitors to Bitcoin that nobody paid any attention to at all until these people successfully, through censorship and propaganda, managed to change the entire economic formula for, for Bitcoin from something that used to be fast, cheap, and reliable to something that was slow, expensive, and unreliable. And that's the Bitcoin Core version that we have today. The Bitcoin Cash version that we have today has the exact same economic formula that made Bitcoin a worldwide success today. And we're going to see here in another moment just how different the two are. You're sweating a little bit more, Simon. Uh, all right. Um, so BTC um, was the, the version of Bitcoin that we've been talking about. And uh, over time, uh, there was a disagreement about how to scale this network, how to um, get more and more transactions within blocks. And this is where uh, probably a three-year uh, debate continues. Now, the bit that I really don't like, um, that I completely uh, cannot support in any way, shape, or form, is that there was definitely some censorship and bias in that debate. So, you know, I'm not a Reddit user. I don't use Reddit, I never have used Reddit. Um, but uh, on Reddit, there was lots and lots of, you know, anyone that disagreed with the path um, of how to get. Uh, you know, what, what, what I guess the core opinion at that, at that time um, was getting their posts um, censored. And, you know, you gave a live example of that last time I saw you, where they put something on the Reddit post, um, and because it was talking about uh, Bitcoin Cash, it got automatically deleted. So this is something that, that I think is, um, that should certainly be condemned, and I'll publicly say that. Um, Thank you for that, Simon. I, a lot of the core supporters actually won't condemn the sense will not condemn the censorship. So I really want to thank you, Simon, for standing up for what's right there. And I guess I'll point out the censorship has been so bad that you literally cannot post a direct quote of Satoshi Nakamoto, the person who created Bitcoin, if you simply post his own words without any commentary whatsoever, they will delete your post to this very day. OK. So, you know, I, I'm not sure you seem to combine those as, as one issue, but, you know, I, I, certainly the debate has been swayed through the censorship. I'm not sure who's doing that. I mean, what is it, Thymos or someone that does that? I'm not a Reddit user, so, you know, I'm not sure if that's 100% connected to the but scaling it, debate. It's, it's not just Reddit. It's also BitcoinTalk.org, and it's also Bitcoin.org. So, so these are three of the most important websites in the entire cryptocurrency ecosystem. 
And if Bitcoin is supposed to be censorship resistant money for the world, we shouldn't trust a bunch of people engaging in censorship to maintain Bitcoin as censorship resistant money. And that's where Bitcoin Core's position is at this point, is a bunch of people that like censorship and are engaging in censorship are maintaining Bitcoin as censorship resistant money. That doesn't make any sense. But, I mean, whatsoever. How, how do we know who's actually doing the censorship? Though? Is it Core or so is it Greg, just Greg people Maxwell, that support Core? Greg Maxwell, the CTO of Blockstream, one of the faces of, of Core, I think we would agree, uh, openly says that he supports the censorship. When I asked Adam Back to condemn the censorship, the best I could get out of him was something along the lines of, I kind of wish they wouldn't do that. But no, we should be standing up and shouting and saying, Bitcoin is about censorship resistant money, and we should all be allowed to discuss this censorship resistant money without censorship. And unfortunately, the people on the Bitcoin core side, by and large, are not saying those things. They're either ignoring the censorship or turning a blind eye to it, or in the case of people like Greg Maxwell, they're openly supporting it. Okay, well, I think we agree on the censorship issue. It shouldn't happen. It's, it's definitely changed the course of Bitcoin and the argument. Should have been an open debate, should have continued without censorship. Um, and I think we agree on that issue. And I guess I'd like to add one additional part to it. The vast, vast majority of Bitcoin users agreed with the roadmap of Bitcoin Cash. But thanks to the censorship of Bitcoin Core and the toxic environment that they created, all of these Bitcoin users left Bitcoin. They went to Ethereum, they went to Dash, they went to Zcash, and a bunch of them now have come to Bitcoin Cash, and lots of them are coming back. But that's been one of the biggest problems caused by the censorship of the Bitcoin core community, is the brain drain upon Bitcoin. Ethereum and Vitalik Buterin would have built the entire project on top of Bitcoin, had it not been from these toxic core developers engaging in censorship and personal attacks against anybody who didn't agree with them. But is it the core developers? Yes, it is. The core developers are censoring those posts or they're just not openly condemning it? It's core developers and people that support the core roadmap, very clearly. Okay. Um, so if we can try and separate that between just an argument about where Bitcoin goes from here with Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. so. I think it comes down to a debate about what people see as the most important user case for Bitcoin. Rogers, you know, so Rogers. I have an yeah. update, if, if I may, on okay. the, the progression here. The fees, the fees are so high on Bitcoin Core that this person is having a trouble even sending the remaining amount to this young lady's wallet. He has to keep making the amount lower and lower. And he's having to make the amount lower and lower. So. And he's using a wallet other than Bitcoin.com wallet, which doesn't have a nice button to say send the maximum amount. So, but how much money do we have left there? Does it even say? So we'll we'll have an update there in a moment, since I think we have quite a few people. Okay, so what, what we're doing that, um, the debate seems to have come to this, how to scale Bitcoin, what it is right now, and how to actually get to where, where they want it to be or where people want it to be. So at the moment, there's no denying that anything that's not Bitcoin, most things that aren't Bitcoin, um, have cheaper transactions because they have less transactions in their blocks, um, they are less used, um, and that makes them cheaper by default, just as Bitcoin was when it was, you know, when no one was really using it in those early days. Um, as something becomes more and more popular, depending on the economics that you set up, if you allow these blocks to be full, then the, the fees of every transaction um, gets more expensive. As people stop using it or use it less, then the fees go down. They created this fee market was where we originally started. Now, so I, actually, I the book. The fee market is something that's very, very recent. Bitcoin grew from nothing into the worldwide phenomenon that it is today, having no fee market. And then a bunch of people came to Bitcoin much, much, much later and said, we need to change the underlying economic model of Bitcoin and introduce a fee market. 
And that fee market was just introduced very, very recently. And in the last year, we watched Bitcoin's market share amongst cryptocurrencies in terms of market cap go from 95% to about 35%. And that's as a direct result of changing the economic model of Bitcoin and making the transactions become slow, expensive, and unreliable due to this brand new fee market that was introduced by a bunch of people with very little to no economic or business background. Because if you think back to your university economics courses, there's a, a, something called substitute goods theory. And that's just a fancy way of saying that if you have two options for two things that do about the same thing, like Coke and Pepsi, or two different flavors of tea, if one costs less than the other, people will tend to use the one that costs less. And we've seen that happen with cryptocurrencies. There's a thousand and one different cryptocurrencies that serve very similar functions. And for example, Bitcoin Cash, the fees are less than one yen. In fact, they're about one-fifth of a yen, Gobu Noichi, in Tesurio for Bitcoin Cash transaction. And on Bitcoin Core, the fees are maybe 50 yen at the moment or so. Uh, depending on what it was, and last year it was around 5,000 yen per transaction. So you have two versions of Bitcoin, one that's incredibly expensive to use in fees, and the other that's basically free. You don't have to be an economics major to figure out which one of those two is going to be more popular, and that's very clearly going to be Bitcoin Cash. And I'd love to hear why you might disagree. Okay, so my, my belief is that BTC is a one-time freak innovation that won't happen again. I think it was created in a set of circumstances at a time that no one cared and took years in order for people to actually start adopting it and gradually get more decentralized over time. So when Bitcoin was originally created, the same group of people were doing the mining, the same group of people were building wallets, the same group of people were doing development, the same group of people were doing everything and gradually over time, it became more and more decentralized and distributed and different people doing that. That took a while for that to happen. That took quite a long time to happen. Now, what it actually ended up creating is, I still believe to this day, and Roger might disagree, the most decentralized thing we have ever seen, which is BTC. The reason that I say that is because BTC has pockets of centralization but none of them control the ecosystem, which was proven by the scaling debate. The fact of the matter is that while you might, we might complain that this Bitcoin core, which is, as, as far as I understand, a group of 100 different developers, 40 of them are um, you know, more active, and three of them are very, very vocal and very, very important, and the complaint was that three of those were all hired by the same company, um, which was a company called Blockstream. Um, some of those have left now as well, so there's two left as far as I know. Um, and uh, that's where they believe that, you know, that there is some kind of centralization within the development. But the development does not represent the entire ecosystem. Um, the development is one part of the ecosystem because the developers have to actually, um, in this, you know, this, this group of 100 people, and there are competing, you can compete with this, um, this implementation as well, but those 100 people all have completely different wide and varied views. Now over time, those that believed in bigger blocks, that wanted, you know, and Gavin Andreessen and various other, Jeff Garzik um, and Mike Hearn and various other developers, um, left the project because they decided, or you know, some people talk about that they were forced to leave in some certain cir circumstances, which again, these needs investigating. But it, it, it tended to diverge upon a, a similar school of thought around that there will be unlimited demand um, for space on these blocks. And therefore, you introduce a fee market to try and reduce spam was one of the things that they put through. And the second was they put together a, a group of technological changes that allowed um, off-chain off innovation and scaling to happen. Now, this is speculative. I agree, this is speculative. Um, they wanted to give it a shot about whether you could create this thing called the Lightning Network, um, and then rather than breaking the core BTC, which I know Roger's gonna say it is broken, but it's still working. Do I you can disagree still that it's broken? It went from no fees, most transactions were completely free, 
to the average transaction fee. The average was $50 per transaction, and anybody running a business was paying more than $1,000 often for one single Bitcoin transaction. Is that not broken to you? It's not broken. It eliminated a certain user case, which is lower value transactions. And lower value transactions is an important user case, but it did get eliminated as we scale, and the, and the core developers are looking at implementing off-chain solutions to allow for infinitely faster transactions, cheaper transactions, but it's speculative. We're not sure if that's going to work yet. And so we saw what happened by that speculative risk. They risked the entire Bitcoin ecosystem, and Bitcoin went from having 95% market share to 35% market share. But I'm not, I'm not sure that's all transaction fees. I think my, my personal belief not is Not only transaction fees, not only did it make the fees go high, but instead of the transactions being instant, in the end of last year, the average wait time was almost 10 days for a transaction to be confirmed on the Bitcoin network. So it went for your average confirmation from being 10 minutes to 10 days. Your fees went from being basically free to $50, and your wait to have your transaction confirmed went from 10 minutes to 10 days. Is that the average or an extreme case? Edge in case. December last year, when the network was completely full, the average confirmation time on the Bitcoin Core network was 240 hours. That's about 10 days to get your transaction confirmed on the network. They completely broke the Bitcoin network, and we shouldn't be surprised at all that people started using things other than Bitcoin. But this, this had coincided with a time of record use, record adoption, record interest, record speculation, that when people we weren't like me, really ready for the scale. That people like myself and Gavin Andreessen, the person that Satoshi Nakamoto turned over the Bitcoin project to, and people like Mike Hearn, who is the senior capacity planner for a little company called Google, so certainly someone who knows about capacity planning, we had been warning for years that we needed to prepare for people to be able to use Bitcoin around the world. But the community wouldn't reach consensus on that. If the, the debate the was going on and on and on. The community and didn't reach consensus because there was censorship of anybody advocating a particular opinion that wasn't in line with the core developers. So the consensus that was reached was one that was reached via censorship. So if you censor any dissenting opinion, you wind up with consensus, and that's what we have. And instead, all of the people that were being censored went and started using things like Bitcoin Cash. And that's why I'm giving the same speech today that I've been giving about Bitcoin for over seven years, and it's about Bitcoin Cash today. Bitcoin Core became some sort of a science project for a bunch of people that are openly hostile to the idea of using Bitcoin as money. Whereas for me, but they're not Bitcoin openly is, they're not openly hostile. I mean, they might have come that way in order to politically. They use it they, as they might have reached that way in order to politically because it's got very political, and people tend to be you know pitching the things that they're trying to so get. So Simon, if but you think Bitcoin, they, they believe that there's a different path to getting to cheaper transactions and 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 more scale. It's, and we've seen that their path failed. They went from 95% well, market it's, it's share. It's certainly not over. Ni 95% To 35%. It's not over yet. Let's continue on the same trajectory and see what happens. But, I well, don't think you have to be a rocket scientist to figure it out, Simon. Well, You're a smart guy. Yeah. We went from 95% to 35% as soon as the blocks became full. The 95%. And you want to continue? But yes, we did go from 95% to 35% and up where we are today. But I don't believe that was just because of transaction fees. It coincided with a, a horrible user experience that came along with it. Not just a horrible user experience for microtransactions, but still you can do everything else apart from those smaller transactions without, you know, that were taken away from that. But you, it coincided with, you know, it's like, so when I was in the market, we used to have an index called the FTSE 100. And the FTSE 100 had a, a, another index called the Vodafone domination, um, the, the, the Vodafone dominance index. And Vodafone was the most dominant in the, um, stock within the FTSE 100. But what never changed about that is they didn't add 350 more stocks and 1,000 more stocks and then have this ginormous ICO bubble where it was creating more and more and more and more rich people that were speculating. They weren't spending these things. It was all speculation. It was rampant speculation. Um, and all of those, were. it was creating a, you know, this, this ginormous amount of... Um, while you could, you could call it competition, I don't think people were using, removing BTC in order to make a cheaper transaction. 
They were just trying to earn more BTC by speculating on other things. And then it goes back and forth, and it coincided with thousands and thousands of cryptocurrencies, people optimizing different user cases, people optimizing privacy, people optimizing cheaper, faster transactions, people optimizing smart contracts. So I'm glad you mentioned privacy. That was another thing that was intentionally destroyed on the Bitcoin Core network by limiting the block size. People used to be able to use all sorts of privacy tools so Bitcoin could be used privately. That's no longer the case on Bitcoin Core because it became too expensive for anybody to afford to use any of those privacy tools. Whereas on Bitcoin Cash, all of those tools are now available again. And according to Ms. Fujimoto, I think we're about out of time. I'll give an update on our experiment here. Um, apparently there was a little bit of a language barrier because somebody along the line already had some Bitcoin. So when we got to the very end of the line, the Bitcoin Cash person still had exactly $10 worth of Bitcoin. It was in yen, but the person with Bitcoin Core had about almost uh, $16 of Bitcoin Core because somebody along the line already had some money. But uh, try this experiment at home with yourself. Uh, it's very, very clear. Bitcoin Cash transactions cost about a fifth of a yen per transaction. Bitcoin Core transactions, depending on the day of the week, are somewhere between 20 yen and 200 yen in fees per transaction. And last year, when more people were still actually using Bitcoin, uh, the fees got up to $50 per transaction on average. Uh, so anyhow, ask yourself, do you want the version of Bitcoin that's slow, expensive, and unreliable, Bitcoin Core, or the version of Bitcoin that's fast, cheap, and reliable, Bitcoin Cash? And it's not a tough decision, but I implore you all to think for yourselves. Thank you very much. Anything Let, to let's, add do our, let's do our closing, because we could go. Is that your closing? That, that's my closing. Think for yourself. OK. All right, so what, what happened to me in, in 2017 is for the very first time in history, we saw young people's path change. The, by that, I mean that um, many young people were, had no, no, they were never going to be investing, they were never going to be savers. They were going to university, they were taking on credit cards, they were taking on their student loans, then they were going to get their job, and then they were going to get a mortgage, and then they were going to contribute to this increasing money supply, and they were never, ever going to save. They were never going to buy bonds. They were never going to buy stocks. They were never going to buy gold, and some of them might actually get on a different path. Now, the... the Can I ask what this has to do with Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Sure, Coin? I'll get to that. Um, so, BTC, what happened with cryptocurrency sector in general is while it was called speculation, call it whatever you want, um, but for the first time, young people started thinking about saving and investing. Um, and saving and investing, this cryptocurrency industry, um, you know, changed, I believe, is changing the path of many of those young people into a new trajectory which isn't contributing to that economy uh, that we were talking about. Now they could have their different flavors, um, and now there's unlimited options and unlimited things that they can think about. But I believe that the where we are right now is not going to be one chain that does everything for everyone. I used to believe in that, um, but then the market, the you know, whatever happened, whatever the reasons that it happened, the blocks changed became that. full, and people start building another chain. But it does not change the fact that I still believe that BTC um, is a unique innovation that has lots of rooms for improvement, that has lots of you know innovation that's coming through, and has a different path of the the fork that came from that. And if people are optimizing for digital savings, yeah, and optimizing for digital cash, and optimizing for smart contracts, I believe it's up to entrepreneurs in the future to put together with all these competing teams, optimizing different things, applications that make it very easy for when you've got your Bitcoin and you need to get it somewhere else in a way that people want to receive it, the wallet, whatever, will just optimize, it will cross chain, it will do things in the most optimal way. And I think that's the path that we're on right now. And what I would like to do, I will answer your question, I promise, is I believe that we are where we are. The censorship issue is a big thing. I'll support you on that, Roger. Um, it's, you know, that, that is a problem, and there needs to be some accountability for that. But I, would, I do not want to see people deliberately trying to kill Bitcoin Cash in order to push Bitcoin Core, or Bitcoin, you know, BTC trying to push BCH, I don't want to see the same. The two chains do not need to try and kill each other in order to succeed. 
And I think we've reached the stage right now where we should allow people to optimize their change. There's too much hate in this community. We've forgotten who the true enemies are. We've forgotten that banks are the winners. The US dollars get the, can be the winner out of all this thing. Um, and we need to reach some more harmony. I don't know how we achieve that, um, but I feel that I, I personally believe that Bitcoin Cash existing keeps Bitcoin core developers more honest. Having competing things um, is important innovation. Um, and I think that we need to move to optimizations of different user cases um, and try and get back to, to more harmony because when we ne have the next systemic risk event, we're going to suddenly realize that we weren't enemies with each other um, and we need, to, we need to move forward because my, my, you know, uh, my final comment, when I saw you on the Alex Jones show, Roger, I, I remember you know, the presentations it used to give, the presentations where you know, inspiring the world to get into Bitcoin. And then when all of a sudden you go on Alex Jones and you're trying to explain to this completely new audience that might be using crypto for the very first time that Bitcoin's this thing that's going to change the world and all the things we believed in, and then at the same time, oh, but it's got corrupted and therefore you should try and use this other thing, I think everyone just comes along and says, and then someone comes along They say on Bitcoin and Cash is Bitcoin because it's the same speech I've been giving for seven years, seven and a half years. It still completely applies to Bitcoin Cash. <coughs> it's no longer true about Bitcoin Core. I didn't but change. But newbies Bitcoin cannot Core get that changed. message. Newbies That's why will I'm helping get spread that message. the message. Thank you, Simon. Okay. Hello, everybody. Really appreciate you watching that video. Hope you enjoyed the content and you got a lot out of it. If you'd like to get a lot more, then please do subscribe to my YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell symbol, and YouTube will send you a notification every time. I'm also giving content on Twitter, at Simon Dixon Twit, so you can follow me there. Um, over the last 10 years since I've been involved in the industry, from speaking at the very first Bitcoin conference in the world, to actually before that, when I was involved in presentations for the banking and monetary reform community, um, I've always been focused on working with the high net worth investors at Bank to the Future and investing in the crypto companies and Bitcoin and fintech companies that made this industry. And that meant that I never really focused on building a following because I really just focused on the relationships that I built. But now there's so much financial uncertainty. There's so much um, challenges that people are experiencing in both the economy and their personal financial situation that I really wanna focus on making sure that more and more people get these messages. So if you leave a comment under this video, let me know what you'd like to see in future videos and also subscribe to the channel and I'll make sure that I'm giving you the best information, the best thinking I've got, which regularly changes as this financial system unfolds. To get that information, subscribe, get the notifications, follow me on Twitter, like, share, so that more people can get this message and I'll make sure that you're on top of the information curve as this financial system unfolds. And remember, no matter how bad it gets, you're alive at one of the most exciting times in financial history. Peace.